So I'd like to continue the talk from the last one, which was about dreams. Uh, so I'd like to talk about it from the point of view of how dreams can be helpful and uh, they are a way that we can communicate with ourselves and also we get perspective on our activities in dreams. I'm not talking about nighttime dreams, I'm talking about daydreams. You've probably noticed that in all the activity of the thinking mind, sometimes the remarks are uncomfortably close to home. In those times, I think you can pay attention to them because you are speaking to yourself. I don't mean that every comment is something worth listening to because most of the thinking mind is like a person who has nothing to do except remark on everything and everybody. And at those times, it's like someone sitting in the back seat of your car on a long journey who never quiets down. If your thinking mind is upbeat, you're lucky because most of the remarks are amiable. But if you're not upbeat, you may hear something hurtful about yourself or others in your own mind. But every once in a while, a tender or quiet voice remarks on something that you might be missing. This is you talking to you. This is like intuition and is very ephemeral. It is so unnoticeable as to be missed if you're daydreaming or looking elsewhere but home. Sometimes we sit in meditation in a half open dream and a half aware consciousness. And the bell reverberates in our body when we hear it. We have hear the sounds around us and our thinking mind slows down and we listen, feel and hear everything. Our eyes close or we stop looking through our half open eyes and everything comes to a half stop. And thinking becomes such a burden that we put it down for a few minutes. For a moment we sit with nothing moving. When the thinking mind stops, quiet mind activates and something begins to move. We aren't controlling anything. We're just observing, just aware. Changes happen within this movement, but we don't understand what they are. We're just aware of them. We wander, uh, <laughs> we wonder, but don't go far enough to put it into words. We're just observing. What is moving when nothing is there? The Heart Sutra says, no mind, no body. When the mind stops, prajna moves. We call prajna paramita the wisdom beyond wisdom. It can't be learned. It first appears when the mind is quiet. When nothing else moves, prajna moves. Awareness is quiet and present. Perhaps awareness is the cognizance of prajna. Nothing moves in prajna, but prajna moves or appears to move. Slowly body and mind begin to fall away. Much is relieved that has accumulated through thought, word, and deed. This happens when the thinking mind, the self-conscious mind, is quiet. But this only happens when everything becomes still and quiet. The Heart Sutra says, with nothing to attain, the Bodhisattva relies on Prajna Paramita. When nothing is left of body and mind, when all is understood to be empty, the Bodhisattva relies on Prajna Paramita. What is Prajna Paramita? It's not a thing. It can't be developed like wisdom or correct behavior. But when everything stops, Prajna moves. Perhaps Prajna is the movement of big mind. 
Perhaps big mind is an expression of prajna paramita. Perhaps prajna is the breath of big mind or the union of big mind that opens prajna. Perhaps it's the breath of the universe. Perhaps it's the breath of our deepest interior, only waiting in silence to be recognized. Being silent seems unattainable because the mind tells us that it's so. If we really want to slow down and calm our mind and body, we must develop a real intent to do so. We can tackle that in two ways. If we have time to sit, if we do it often and practice breath control, our thinking mind will calm down. But if we must be out in the working world, then talking much less than usual will also slow down the thinking mind. In both ways, we have to ignore the mind that tells us it's not worth it. Silence is impossible or it's an illusion. We have to completely ignore that kind of thought. Then we have to study what talking does to us and how it diverts us from experiencing silence. Then we have to study how it increases mind activity. Like the more we talk, the more we spin the wheel of the thinking mind. The more we make conversation, the more we grease the wheel, the turning wheel of thought. It's worse with entertainment talking because it's more difficult to stop once we start. And ego encourages conversation. It's even worse with drinking alcohol. We relax and feel very comfortable and upbeat. And the more the mind turns, the more we're urged from ego to speak without let up. If we made a pact with ourselves to practice silence as if we were in a temple, no matter what we're doing, and only spoke when it was truly necessary, then serious intent would create a calm and composed thinking mind when next we sat. It takes time to create that kind of composure in sitting or working and being mindful of talking. But if the intent is there, it can be done. We can do it in small, relentless increments to change slowly, talk less, and look and listen more. Dreams, on the other hand, loosen our rigid mind, even though we're urged to speak more when we indulge in them. And speaking more means a busier thinking mind. But dreams can also block our true creativity when the ego takes charge. But in an exploratory dream, we can work out our problems, like a child play acting. We can run through scenes of what actions would have worked and what what wouldn't have worked. But we cannot forget that we are dreaming, ever. When we sit in silence, that can also be a dream, but not one we can understand with a conscious mind since words are not related to it. When body and mind drop off, it's also something beyond words and not understandable to a thinking mind. In the silence of Zazen, much of the harmful and irrelevant byproducts we accumulate through thought, word, and deed can finally be let go. And we can enjoy much of the mental and emotional debris that will fall away and that has always caused us suffering. This also seems to happen as if in a dream. But the after effects of negativity and daydreaming can fall away in silence. But with the first thought, even in silence, the first thought that appears, the mind changes to a rush of emotions and thinking again. Yet even here, no matter how heavy with thought and emotion the mind may be, this also can change to silence again with the simple act of breath control on the cushion. It is a matter of one's intent and effort over and over again. Will we be afraid to live in silence? That seems to be our biggest block. Or will we surrender our ego and make a choice to practice seriously with breath to calm our body and mind enough to meet silence again and again? Will we sit in silence patiently when prajna moves and body and mind begin to drop off? Or will we look for escape? It's always our choice. Thank you. 
So please bring your questions and Peter will join us here. <clears throat> there you go. Any questions? Oh, Daniel? You Dan? mentioned that you mentioned that prajna can't be developed, but can it be cultivated? Cultivated probably if for example, you cultivate it whenever you sit without paying attention to your thinking when you when you follow breath control like counting breaths or just following breaths you're cultivating it yes and what is the what is the best i hate to use the word approach or attitude towards cultivating that prajna just that you're you're con content to just put all your effort into the immediate act of breathing and wait and see what happens not to feel that you have to control anything just your breath and once you once you control your breath to a point where your body souls slows down and your thinking slows down and you start to hear things differently than when you're annoyed by sound but you just start hearing sound then you're open to anything and when you're open anything can happen so the thing is just to put the effort into mastering your breath but not trying to control everything and say you encounter sort of a an obstacle or a block like inside your body or inside your mind sort of like a knot breath will help that you can't reach in and untie it unless you're really good at it <laughs> but <laughs> you can you can sit and uh and try relaxing your whole body and mind by breathing slowly yeah it's a kind of situation in meditation where you don't you both control the situation and you don't control it at all you're in a situation where you sit with wholeheartedness but you don't determine the outcome of any of it it just happens with your breathing and it at first anyway you you uh just try to calm down every part of your body and mind okay thank you you're welcome mike you had your hand up oh mike I was wondering if you make a concerted effort to quiet your mind while meditating, that becomes a thought itself and you can get caught up in the thought of trying to stop your thinking. It's true. So do you just try and just let it flow through and that will quiet the mind because now you're not trying to think about stopping it. You just let it do what it does and it will quiet on its own. Is that what you're talking about with Prajna, that it will quiet down without you trying to quiet down, which makes you think about trying to do it while you're thinking about not, not thinking? That's what we do all the time in Zazen. We just let it go through and don't interfere with it. Let it, let it flower any way that it wants and it, then does it go out the other side, as it were. Yeah, that's important because if the minute you try to control it, get rid of it or something, then you get involved in it and you start in the thing of attaching to it in some way. So the best thing in, when you're sitting like this is just to let everything go through, whatever it is, the emotions, even the physical sensations that come, you know, they sometimes they can be like overwhelming, but there are times when you can just sit with them and let them pass. And everything, you let it come in and go out. You don't hang on to any of it. 
and see what's behind all of it. Yeah, because sometimes, I hate to say this, I don't even realize I'm daydreaming while I'm meditating. And all of a sudden I go, wait a minute, I'm in the middle of a thought process. What am I doing here? And then I try to stop it and then it takes off in that direction. And I'm just, you know, so you just got to let it go, do what it's going to do. And just don't get attached to it as it passes through your mind. Yeah, even a daydream, let it pass through. Just don't uh, waste time on it. Just uh, keep breathing, bringing yourself back to the immediate act of breathing. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. John. I just had a question. So when you talk about um, controlled breathing, so the way I had always approached it and the way I always understood it is that during Zazen, really, you weren't supposed to try and control your breathing but rather just be aware, fully aware of your breathing. But so like when I'm counting or if I'm counting, for instance, it's not like a conscious, like, you know, breathing in, breathing out, you know, in a conscious manner while I'm counting it. It's more so just letting breathing naturally happening and just following it. Yes. Or am I wrong? No, that's correct. But it's uh, only after you've first started counting your breath, which is a kind of control. And it often makes people very self-conscious when they start doing it. But if you keep doing it, it becomes much more relaxed. And when you get that relaxed, then you can drop the numbers and just follow the breath. And that's still a kind of control. At a certain point, you're talking about when you're completely relaxed and you just keep your mind on the awareness of the breathing happening naturally. Yeah. So I say control, it's not actually control, it's just trying to bring yourself into the present, uh, even through counting, just bringing yourself from daydreaming or whatever and bringing your mind and your body into one place. It's that kind I of think, So initially though, I mean, just the, at least in, it, in my experience with Zazen, initially it, there is and has to be some control, like bringing, uh -huh. replacing your, your small mind, your monkey mind thoughts with the counting or with whatever your anchor is that you're using during your meditation, replacing it consciously. Yeah. But then like you said, as, as things fall away and you relax, those things too fall away. Yeah, right, so. exactly. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jane. Marvin? Um, you mentioned dreams versus exploratory dreams. Can you talk a bit more about that? Because it seems like, uh, how would you know? Well, it's one is deliberate and the other happens often without your consent or even without knowing you're doing it. Like you find yourself in the middle of a daydream before you realize you're daydreaming. But suppose you have a big argument with someone and you afterwards you settle down and you're trying to calm down but in your mind you start running through possible other ways to have handled it you know like you think well if i had done this and they had done that it might have worked better or if i had gone on this side and they took that side you could just run through your mind i mean i've often done that in the past you know like particularly uh when i would have an argument with somebody that i was close to because you don't want to have bad feelings afterwards. So you're trying to work out how to get rid of the negativity in your mind at the time. So you run through, you think, well, if I had said this, or if I hadn't said this, that would have happened. And, and if, maybe if I had extended something that would happen. And that's a kind of uh, daydreaming that you're in control of. And you're, you're working out a kind of negative response that you can't get rid of just with your mind. So you're, you're working it out through a daydream. How, how would you do that? And then as you see, well, this might have worked better, you start to feel better. And that's a way of getting control of that negativity. Why do you call it a dream? Isn't that just thinking through something? I think it would be it, except for me, it's like, it's always been imaginative in, in seeing the whole scene all over again. So in that sense, it's more like a dream for me anyway. And probably you can work it out with your thinking. But for me, I would just imagine the entire scene all over again. 
as if I was in a movie, you know, and trying to work it out. So people don't have to do that. I mean, that's just a possibility that you can well, do. That. I'm a little confused because I thought that the the idea was to kind of develop a practice so that the thoughts drop away. But here it seems like the notion of dreams is is kind of an excuse to continue thinking without calling it a thought. No, it's not. The idea of a thought is it's a useful tool depending on how we use it. And it, when we're unconscious, it's a, uh, a tyrant. And it can mess our lives up pretty badly if we start getting into the belief of what we're feeling. And so if you're if you have really negative thoughts, you might get into a really negative emotions because of it. But that's not I mean, the thought itself, there's nothing wrong with thinking and or with thoughts. The thoughts are that when we're, when they're out of control, we uh, don't know how to handle them correctly but we can handle them in a daydream, for example, and you use it in a useful thing in our work, or when we plan something, we can use it usefully. But when it's just rampaging in our mind, it's not very useful, it's just using up energy. And it's coming through our mind, and if we're creative in any way, we might even use some of it as a creative beginning. But there's nothing wrong with thought itself but the thought as a tyrant is a problem for egging on the emotions, for example. We are, we are not conscious of really of daydreaming. Yeah, most of the daydreams just run through yeah, before so, we even saw them. Yeah. Do you have any other questions on this? No, I'm, uh, John is next. John. I'm sorry, I just want to comment and, and say, um that i but i think you explained it and that is that there's a difference between just our minds our monkey mind just running free all day long in daydream and consciously using like we talk about thoughts and feelings getting away from us but those are also tools where if we if, if the question really is is the tool using you or are you using the tool at the moment exactly are and it reminds course? me of a it reminded me of something I read about the Dalai Lama and uh, actually a, a form of meditation that he takes on that's different from his standard meditation. And he said where he he sits, but like you said, Jane, where you kind of like almost like you're watching a movie and working through a scenario or something you're thinking about. That's what he says he literally does is he tries to separate himself from whatever this is. He tries to separate it from it being his own thoughts and his own feelings and tries to like project it and look at it almost as if it's a, a third party thing that he's examining and that he's working through. And that's like his consciously using the mind as a tool, not allowing the mind to work against you, you know, tooling you. Yeah, actually that's, that's a very creative way, I think, to handle your problems is, is to use it that way. Because I've, I've often found that when I've been in like really angry, really furious and negative emotions and feeling like I'd love to just tear up something. Then when I went through the thing and worked it out in my mind, well, this would have happened, then that would have happened, then this would have been better. And then all the good emotions that might have happened from it start to fill me and all that negativity starts to wash away. So I, I've always found it's like just creative uh, playing with your imagination to work out a problem that's really driving you mad. That's what I think. Thank you, Jane. You're welcome. Rachel. In a um, certain sense, could it all, that kind of uh, reflective dreaming be described as um, creating uh, with words like poems in, instead of the effort to make a didactic poem a dogmatic one that is written to express uh, an ideal or you're writing it to get your point across <laughs> versus um, creating in a, you find yourself in a more spacious way and you as you work on it there are different ideas and you can or or i suppose painting 
and you end up uh, perhaps expressing something you did not set out to do. In other words, within you, um, there was a sort of a summer cyclone, you know, a movement and something comes out. And when, if you really can craft it, it will express something, but you didn't sit down saying, I'm going to teach this. <laughs> You just have written something or possibly painted something. Um, and then there it is. And it does make sense, even if you have to perhaps work on it more. But you didn't do it to ex uh, to say, um, my point is. It, it didn't even, in some senses, have to do with me. Thank you. Is that it? Mike? I may be weird, but when I used to count my votes, I could still have daydreams around the counting of my votes. I had my breaths. So I finally had to quit counting my breaths because it almost stimulated more thought inside of me. And it was like, I could actually go one and I'm gonna go do this two, And then I'm gonna do this three. And it's like, I, I don't know if anybody else has that problem, but. That's one of the reasons why I gave up counting my breaths because I could still think around it. <laughs> it's true. It's very possible to be doing one thing. I can be chanting a sutra and be all thinking about what I was going to do later on. Yeah, it's, but that's, that's a case where we have to start practicing discipline really hard, you know, and, and do it until you can do it. It's like uh, trying to do something and, and uh, your mind is like trying to take control of it. And so, you have to show your mind who's boss in a way. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, Chris. Uh, I remember at some point I kind of went through a phase where I'm just like, I'm not even going to try and focus on my breath or stay in the present moment and look at the wall. I'm just going to think. And like, I would just like let my brain go and do its thing. And I was following it and I was playing along with it. And then at some point I got tired of doing that and now I don't really count my breaths, but I also don't, you know, like I'll, I'll still find myself and sort of adjust just like if I find myself off in thought, sometimes I'll notice my posture has sort of slipped. So every now and then I'll sort of check in and I'm making a habit. You know, when I practice Zazen, I'm sort of practicing I'm practicing periodically noticing what's going on in the present moment specifically with regards to my mind and my posture, and then addressing it. And that could mean a lot of things. Sometimes it's just noticing it and then going right back to it. But you remember one time I had a, I had a conversation with Victoria Austin and she said something like, look, maybe, you, you know, essentially, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but she said essentially like, you know, if it comes right down to it, at least try and think about Dharma stuff, you know, try and <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to think you might as well think about Dharma. That's tall order. <laughs> well, well, think about it, you know, Shikantaza, which is what we're all practicing in a way until we really start practicing it, is that uh, we sit without any thinking. We're not counting breaths. We're not even following breaths. We're just sitting and uh, and everything that comes in is just part of that sitting whether it's sauce or anything, but we practice non-attachment during that time, 100% non-attachment. So no thought comes in that we grab, no emotion comes in, no sensation or, or uh, physical idea comes in. Everything that's there, just we let it sit there if it wants to. It's like you're gathering everything back to yourself in a way, and you're not throwing away anything. It's like you're taking all the stuff that you might have thrown away at one time, rushes of thoughts, rushes of emotion, physical sensations that drove us crazy, and you're just letting it sit there with us and making no effort to do anything with it. And at that point, I think we are starting to gather back to ourselves what we've thrown away so easily over the years. And so all we're doing is reaching that point where we're willing to sit with everything willing to sit with a really unruly bunch of people, as it were. Uh, do you recommend trying to get better at sleeping during Zazen? 
Uh, well, I think uh, sleeping is actually one of the good things in Zazen <laughs> because when you're sleeping, you're not, uh, you're too tired to think, you're too tired to feel, you're too tired to imagine. You just want to sit there and go to sleep. And all you have to do is keep from going to sleep. That's the only thing you have to do because you're otherwise you're perfect. <laughs> you're, you're sitting in perfect Zazen. Everything's relaxed. Your mind's relaxed. Your thoughts are too tired to, to move. You know, so that's why sashins are so good, because by the fourth or fifth day, you really are at that point where you're just too tired to do anything, and you're willing to just sit, and all you have to do is keep awake. That's the only thing. So it's good to be able to sleep in zazen, because then keeping yourself from sleeping in zazen is the only thing you have to worry about. That's right. So best not, to sleep. <laughs> best not to sleep in Zazen, but when you get to the point where you're really willing to just sleep with your eyes open, you're in a perfect state every other way, other than trying to stay awake. And also, depending on your Zendo, you may get smacked with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. You had, Then you have the extra work to stay awake. <laughs> you have the extra impetus to stay awake. <laughs> Man. <laughs> yeah, I, um, <laughs> Peter, uh, can I share something that uh, we discussed in Doku-san that's uh, very pertinent to what uh, uh, Chris has brought up and Jane's response? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I had a uh, uh, Zazen period that uh, during a Zazen Kai that um, something something came up during it uh and i just decided to to it it had to do with practice it had to do with you know what uh the comment uh that that uh chris shared uh, you know if you're going to think about uh, something think about dharma something related to the dharma and uh so i just this this was seemed so important at the time that that i just wanted to process it i just wanted to take all of these divergent things that that i've encountered for the last 30 odd years in my practice and uh, uh i could just see relationships forming about how it was all related i, I was concerned that if i let go of it that I wouldn't be able to return to it. Uh, and Peter, uh, Peter's comment was, but that's impure Zazen. I think that was the word that you used. Uh, yeah. <laughs> something akin to that. And, um, uh, and I've come to, to agree with that. You know, the, the, uh, uh, the real challenge for me and, and I think for a lot of people in, in sitting is is to really really accept the fact that your only responsibility in the world at that time is zazen is following your breath and letting go of the thoughts and um and because that's that's the letting go uh, as jane likes to say everything must go and that's that's letting go that's no matter how important a thought seems it has to be um i don't know the word word just arose in my mind abandoned in a sense it has to be let go that's all chris did you have your hand up no i was just saying you need to cut it off or cut it free. Yeah. Yeah, actually, we were talking with Matt with uh, about the way the stores have those big sales, you know, for like every week, <laughs> every year, everything must go. <laughs> big sale, everything must go. <laughs> Nothing retained. <laughs> Nothing kept. Okay. So is that all the questions? <laughs>